So let's move on a little bit um, now to HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer. Um, and I think that uh, this is really one of the success stories, I think, of medical oncology, especially in the breast field. I think we really have changed the natural history uh, of this entity, and I think that we're all very excited about it. Uh, but there's still more room for refinement. And um, let me start with Kim. I mean, what do you think your optimal treatment is now for someone who comes in with HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer? Say a woman walks in the door, again, de novo, um, who, say, has a few bone mets and maybe a few asymptomatic liver metastases that aren't too large, her liver enzymes are normal, you know, what would be your uh, upfront therapy for her? And she's her too amplified. What would be your uh, upfront therapy for her? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm sad that she finds herself in this situation, but my own thought when I see this woman is, oh, thank goodness she has her two positive <laughs> breast cancer, <laughs> and thank goodness I know what to do with this woman because we have very large-scale phase three studies that actually demonstrate a survival advantage in the first-line setting, in the second-line setting. Um, so I, don't, I won't say HER2-positive breast cancer is easy for me or the patient, but we at least have some fairly sizable data sets to base our decisions on. And so for the patient you described, and I would say for people who have no symptoms, have moderate symptoms, or have a high burden of symptomatology from their metastatic disease, the standard of care is taxane, pertuzumab, and trastuzumab. And the recent Cleopatra presentation at this year's ESMO demonstrated a 15.7 month, I always have to stop, 15.7 yeah. month improvement in overall survival for adding a monoclonal antibody to what I would have given her two years ago. Um, largest survival, I've said this, you can, anyone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that is the largest survival advantage ever seen in a non-placebo controlled study in any solid tumor. So um, I think that that pretty much has led to the standard of care, not a standard of care, the standard of care being pertuzumab, trastuzumab, and ataxane for first line HER2 driven metastatic breast cancer. So let's talk, and we, I agree, I mean, I think it really is a major advance, and, but there are subtleties even to that. As medical oncologists, we always look for the subtleties. So the first subtlety is, what taxing, does it matter, Lee, what taxing you use? With I don't think it matters. Um, in Europe, uh, docetaxel is favored. In the U.S., paclitaxel weekly is favored. Um, we're not going to have a head-to-head -head comparison. I, I think most people are very comfortable using either of the taxanes in optimal fashion, along with the dual antibody therapy. And so the next question is, how long do you give the taxane? We know that it was a fixed period, I believe, in Cleopatra, if I'm not mistaken. Ruth, how long would you give the taxane in this before you stop and just give her HP afterwards? Yeah, I mean, I tend to use docetaxel just because it's easier to give it on a three-week schedule. I'd usually do six cycles and then drop the chemo if they're having a good response. That's usually what I do, which I think is in keeping with the trial. And so the next question is, um, if you stop it after the six cycles, you put someone on HP, again, assuming she's ER negative for the time being, and then, say, nine months later, a year later, she now has progression again. Uh, Rich, would you use, would you add back the taxane or do yeah, something else? Yeah, I think else? with that disease-free interval, uh, it would be, not be unreasonable to try it, depending on the toxicity and her response. Uh, why did we stop the docetaxel at six months? Was it just because of the protocol, or were they developing neuropathy or difficulty uh, taking the drug? But I think a disease-free interval of a year would not be unreasonable to go back, because at the end of the day, we still have limited uh, you know, chemotherapy options down the road. So I kind of agree with you, and I've tried that experiment, and it's not worked very well. Okay. And we don't have you know, prospective data about it. It would make sense that you throw the cytotoxic back on, you get a meaningful response, you stop it. But my own anecdotal experience in probably 10, 15 patients now, now that the drug's been around for a little while, is that you add the cytotoxic back on and the reality is it doesn't work that well. So in that situation, I would probably switch to TDM1. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's because the chemotherapy probably doesn't matter all that much. No, I, I think I would, I would kind of agree with that. I think the really one or two more things I want to talk about before we go. I mean, so just in keeping with the pertuzumab for the time being, we know now that pertuzumab has a neoadjuvant indication. And so the first question for everybody is, what is your go-to regimen uh, for, uh, say, a woman comes in with, again, an ER negative, HER2 amplified tumor, say a locally advanced tumor, five, six centimeters, or say five centimeters in diameter. You know, would you, what's your go-to regimen for neoadjuvant therapy given that? 
Uh, we'll start. I know from the West Coast what right. the answer is going to well, be before we I go actually any further, have so. We actually have an <laughs> interesting clinical study, uh, the Christine study, or, or TRIO, uh, TRIO 21, which is evaluating uh, TD, TDM1 in that setting with pertuzumab versus the combination. Uh, it's also biomarker driven. So I, I think that that's an interesting place to go in the context of a clinical study. Outside of that, I think uh, pertuzumab, trastuzumab, docetaxel is reasonable. Okay. So I give TCHP. TCHP. So we have data from Trifena um, in the neoadjuvant setting. It avoids the anthracycline. Um, and that's kind of my go-to regimen, although I am, I will consider adding an anthracycline out back. Mm -hmm. In the fairly rare circumstance where there's a high burden of disease, and I tend to think that that occurs when the tumor is not so HER2 addicted or HER2 driven, and so at least I feel better. Um, Neosphere had an anthracycline up front, so I'll give it post-surgery post for high residual burden of disease, or I will refer to a clinical trial that would randomize a patient to an outback therapy. Right, like which TDM1. is such as like TDM1, right, Catherine, this is the TDM1 trial. So, Lee, yeah, go ahead. So I have a slightly, so I sit um, just on the Mississippi, halfway between the East Coast and the West Coast <laughs> camps, so we're he evenly divided to TCHP and uh, an AC followed by uh, taxane. Uh, Bridget and Herceptin. Okay, so um, you're half of but, but what I do a little differently, I tend to try to give all the chemotherapy up front. So if we have a large disease burden, I will try to continue dual antibody therapy in that case. So you will. So you will. That's the question I was going to ask everybody, I think. You know, there's been a huge amount of controversy because of the NCCN recommendation mm -hmm. to continue the dual antibody therapy after the TCHP is given or after any new ACTHP. You know, and if you, even without disease burden, you know, there was a recommendation, I think, from the NCCN, which I'm not sure has been withdrawn yet, um, that you continue the dual antibody blockade without any real data. I mean, we have a trial, you know, that hopefully uh, affinity that will answer that at some point. Um, but do you continue? So you do in, in high disease burden then, in someone who still has residual. Or essentially any disease burden if we don't get a PCR. So you will continue yeah. HP? I actually continue it out back for everyone because really? I okay. argue if you have a complete pathologic response to it dual antibody, why wouldn't you give it for a year? Very similar to why we give TRAS for a year. And we have some data that a year of TRAS is better than six months. Yeah. It's hard to imagine that that won't apply to the highly effective other antibodies like pertuzumab. So I found something I disagree with came on, so I'll, I'll okay. take this. And I, so. I hope the insurers aren't listening. <laughs> so if, if, we do, if we do, conceptually, if we do neoadjuvant therapy to get a PCR and we get a PCR and we believe that data, Shouldn't we do, be doing a trial of no therapy as opposed to dual antibody therapy? Once you've cured the cancer, you've cured the cancer. So there's no additional benefit. I mean, I don't know the answer to that, and it's perfectly no, it's reasonable. A, or what, I think it's more a question of what is the degree of additional benefit you'll get, and right. is it worth the additional one year of pertuzumab? I think that's really the question. I mean, I, don't I, know the answer. I agree with Lee. I think if it's an yeah. ER negative cancer, the question, and they get a PAT CR, I don't know what are the treatments you need, I mean, at that point. I know we have yeah. to give trastuzumab, but I, I personally have never given the two antibodies together. But I think the TDM, and I think the Catherine, I think it's Catherine, is that right? There's one is Caitlin and one that's Catherine. I always forget which one is which. But one is TDM1 versus nothing, actually, or versus Herceptin, right. after, versus Traz after that. So that would be an interesting trial.